We're looking at the rest of Descartes' discourse on method, and it's kind of a hodgepodge. Um, chapter four, or part four, is where the real philosophical meat, except for you know, one other section, lies. Uh, and that's actually a summary of what he's doing in one of his other works that, that you might have read um, in, in other classes, The Meditations on First Philosophy. And he's running through it pretty quick. Um, and we'll come back to that. The other thing that he touches on that I think you guys will find interesting is this discussion about human beings and animals and machines. Usually that's one area of Descartes that you know never fails to get people um, thinking about interesting ideas. He's got some ideas of his own about how you could tell, say, a cyborg apart from a robot, apart from a, a <coughs> some sort of, you know, test tube grown human being, um, all these sorts of things that we <coughs> talk about in science fiction. Um, and we'll come to that too towards the end of class. But before that, I actually want to skip ahead to part six. And part six, when you read through it, you might say, this is really dry stuff. You know, what is he, he's just going back and forth about, should I write, shouldn't I write, should I write, shouldn't I write. And obviously, he's already made a decision to write because you've got the text, right? Um, but Descartes is telling you something in part six um, that's, that's kind of good for, for contextualizing what he's up to. You remember that I said that Descartes is one of the fathers of modernity, one of the modern way of approaching things. And how so? Well, you know, he tries to wipe everything away and start anew. That's a particularly modern idea that instead of building on the old or taking the old and integrating it, we're going to just like, you know, get rid of everything and then start from, from the foundations. Um, ironically, it's been done so long that it's, no really, it's not really that modern of an idea. It's now kind of a, a old fashioned idea. Um, but he's also important because he, he has this conception of what it is that, that philosophy could do that's based on something like a metaphor of a tree. He, he has this in other works where he says, well, if we can just get the trunk right, the foundation, then it's going to branch off into these other things. And there's three M's associated with Descartes' ideas about this. In this book, he is kind of, care, uh, kind of uh, hedgy about um, what he calls morals. He says, well, everybody's you know, got a good sense about that. They can figure that out on, on their own. He doesn't really believe that. That's window dressing. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then there's what we could call mechanics. And then there is medicine. So the three M's. And Descartes thinks that if we, if we change philosophy so that, you know, <coughs> There's another M too. So you get the metaphysics, right? That is going to lead to advances in, in this. And remember, back to you know the, the first parts of this. How were other people learning their philosophy? How are they learning their metaphysics? They'd go find somebody else's books and then they read them and then you know memorize part, parts of them and say, you know, when we get to a problem, well, Aristotle said this. And they probably weren't going to make a lot of contributions to mechanics or, or medicine because they, were, they weren't doing experiments for the most part. They were uh, <coughs> relying on <coughs> of, uh, authority. So, you know, think about your science classes. You can learn science, and the science that we have is much better than the science they had at that time. Um, but, you know, if you actually learn something about the history of science, you realize that. Um, they thought that, you know, 100 years ago, but 100 years ago they also believed in, in the, the ether. You know, that radio waves and things like that were carried through the ether. Nobody believes that now. That was a central part of their scientific conception. So there are advances in science, and our, our science that we have right now could be superseded. Now imagine that you're going to learn science, and all you do is study textbooks all the time. Do you really know science? You know what somebody's put together of science. Can you actually go out in the world and apply that? 
to very marginal degree. Yeah, I mean, you might be, you know, if you're, if you're pretty uh, smart, you might go around and say, okay, I see how this over here looks like this, this diagram in the book, you know. Um, why, do you, why do you guys have to, have to do labs? That's one of the things that people don't like about taking science classes, right? To actually like, witness the things that you're learning and feel like they're real so that you can believe them. Yeah, it's not just so you can believe them, it's so you can actually see that, look, here's, here's an external world. Here's what, what I've got stuck in my head. There is some sort of mapping between the two of these that uh, is, is fairly reliable. Uh, another good thing about doing labs, when I was in high school, nothing ever went the way it was supposed to. Um, you know, our chemistry labs, half the time the experiments didn't work. And now why is that a valuable learning experience? To prepare you for a life that's never going to pan out the way you like? No. <coughs> also, so that if you can like anticipate other circumstances or other types of like factors that can come into play and like make things not work as I yeah. Guess. And you can figure out why did this go wrong. You can introduce like I said other factors. There's something else going on here. You know, the the wind is blowing in the air and the Bunsen burner is actually not hitting the thing the way it's supposed to. Well, let's fix that. You know. Um, it's only by actually interfacing the, the, what we would call the practical with the theoretical that you really develop full knowledge. Those of you who are thinking about going into business, imagine trying to run a business according to business textbooks. You know, or communication. You know, your communication textbooks, they have a lot of nice principles, but is that really human communication in, a, in its fullness? Psychology is the same way. You know, you can run down all these these things, and the idea is: look, you know, you can't just read the book and morning and study, you know, what some author said, and then know all about the world, or know all about the self, or know all about whatever it is that you want to know. You actually have to do something. You actually have to get out there and get your hands dirty, and that's what happens in all of these, you know. Mechanics, um, you could actually think, you know, of like a grease monkey, right? Um, mechanical things use grease, you know why? Because they got moving parts and they have to be lubricated. And, lubri you know, lubrication always attracts dirt. And that's why mechanical stuff tends to be kind of sooty and grimy. Uh, and this is kind of, you know, joking around about that. But you really do have to get your hands dirty if you want to know something about how machines work. Um, medicine. Well, you don't have to get your hands dirty. Sometimes you got to get them bloody, you know. Um, morals. You know, it's one thing to have some sort of theory about what the good is or what the purpose of human life is or what's right and wrong. It's a whole other thing when you get into tough situations, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the weakness of the will and when you get tempted and stuff like that. That's when you actually learn some of that practical experience. Now Descartes thinks if you can get the metaphysics right, then you're going to be a lot more successful with these things. And you might say, well, what do metaphysics and morals have to do with each other? I'm actually going to put that off because uh, Descartes is not going to spell that out here, but other authors would. But let's look at what he says about mechanics and, and medicine. So he says, um, my speculations pleased me a great deal. This is in part six. I thought other people who had their own speculations, I thought other people also had their own speculations, which pleased them perhaps more. But immediately after I had acquired some general notions concerning physics and starting to test them on particular difficulties, I noticed where they could lead. I thought I could not keep them hidden without sinning greatly against the law which obliges us to promote as much as we can the general good of all men, which, by the way, is a moral principle, right? What's he getting at here? He said, For my notions had made me see it's possible to reach understandings which are extremely useful in life, and that instead of the speculative philosophy which is taught in the school, so instead of just reading Aristotle or reading Plato, um, when he talks about philosophy, that includes a lot of what we nowadays call the sciences. We can find a practical philosophy by which, through understanding the force and actions of fire, air, water, stars, heavens, and all the other bodies which surround us. Um, we could use them in the same way for all applications for which they're appropriate and thus make ourselves, as it were, the masters and possessors of all nature. So Descartes is talking about getting the philosophy right so that then you can start doing technology. 
met, doing, doing mechanics, start making human life better by applying all these natural things that we, we learn. If you actually understand how they work, then you can make them do what you want, right? Um, think about some of the technology that had to be understood before we could have anything like this that we take for granted, you know, or like that, that flip cam. I mean, that's, that's just incredible uh, technology compared to 30 years ago. How did we get all these things so small? How did we miniaturize all of this? What was the, the, the key breakthrough that had to happen? Chips. Chips, yeah, and, and computer chips, right? Miniaturized circuits that contain millions of little tiny on-off <coughs> switches. You know, it's logic that, that's built into that. Somebody had to think that up. Somebody actually had to sketch all this stuff out, and then they had to have a design process for that. That's mechanics. That's what Descartes is talking about there. Do, does this make your life easier? And not all of you have an iPhone. All of you have a phone of some sort, right? Um, some of you have, you know, other brands. Some of you operate with Android or what's, what are other. Some of you may actually have a BlackBerry. I don't know. That's kind of fading out. But um, except for like business types, you know, people get encrypted things. Um, does this improve your life? Or let me let me put it to you this way, since you've probably had this most of your time. Um, what would a day be like for you, where you go to class? And then you suddenly realize you not only don't have your phone, you have no idea where it's been for the last day. It'd be a lot more peaceful. Oh, really? Because <laughs> nobody would be texting you or calling you. You wouldn't have any alerts. You can put it on silent, you know. You can, you can ignore those things. <coughs> Are we dependent on, on these things for a lot of that? I mean, I don't know anybody's phone numbers anymore. I don't even wear a watch because, you know, if I want to find out what time it is, I just click click this and that's how I figure it out, you know. Um, when, I, when I misplace this, I'm totally, you know, at, at, at sea. And if I misplace it at home while my wife isn't there who has another phone and who could call my phone so I might hear where it's ringing, I'm totally at a loss. We're dependent on mechanics for the, the way in which we live. We're at the hind end of what Descartes is, is projecting. What about medicine? <coughs> Um, why is he so interested in that? Well, you know, if we think about what medicine does, it makes our life better, doesn't it? Um, we were just talking with the, the uh, um, cleaning staff about knees, because I'm now at the age where, you know, because I didn't take care of myself the way I ought to, and, and did a lot of, you know, foolish things when I was young that stressed my body out, I've got a knee that, you know, creaks a lot and gives me some pain, and someday it's probably going to have to be replaced. Now, in Descartes' time, they didn't do that sort of thing, right? I, I have uncles and cousins, because I have a lot of you know, family in the trades. They you know, just got both their knees replaced at once with titanium joints, and they're, they're perfectly happy with it. That has really improved their life, hasn't it? It's prolonged their life in certain ways. Um, many of us, if it wasn't for some sort of medical intervention, might not actually be alive today. Odds are that, that um, given, you know, human epidemics and stuff like that, um, probably half of you wouldn't be here if, if we didn't have any sort of medicine. Um, I think about childhood diseases, the ones we've managed to wipe out. Polio's been gone for two generations. It used to be just a crippling plague. How do you get there? Do you get there by just reading books, seeing what Aristotle thought about it, or in the case of medicine, reading Gollin? or Parcellus, or people like that. No, you actually got to cut people open, and, and animals open, and see what makes them work, and try to put them back together in ways that don't kill them, and then, you know, hopefully improve their life, and you got to, you know, have people take medicines and see whether it kills them or makes them better. You got to do experiments, right? Descartes is interested in that, and he tells you that he actually devoted much of his time after doing his philosophy to trying to make progress in medicine. Um, he actually got himself sick and died trying to do experiments having to do with you know snow and uh, and preservation of, uh, of tissues up in Sweden. Not a smart place to, to do that sort of thing. Um, he had been invited by the Queen. There's there's a whole story there. Um, but Descartes has another thing that he says about medicine too. 
He says, the mind depends so much on the temperament and condition of the organs of the body. If it's possible to find some means to make human beings generally wiser and more skillful than they've been up to this point, I believe we must seek that in medicine. Isn't that an interesting idea? If we want to make human beings generally wiser and more skillful than they've been up to this point, I believe we must seek that in medicine. Now, think about some of the things in our own uh, era that that that. <coughs> um, are there any problems that people have that would keep them from being wiser and more skillful that we, we solve through medical means that you can think of? Yeah. Um, just recently, they actually have created a completely artificial arm. Oh, really? Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I'm trying, I cannot remember the guy's... And it like attaches to a human... Yeah, it's, it's based off a female, the weight of a female arm, and it attaches either to neural remaining nerve signals in a mounted shoulder, or down to a foot pad in your shoe to manipulate the arm. Okay, that would help us a lot with mechanics. What would affect our minds, though? What what, what makes us smarter or better able to concentrate? Or yeah. Some people um, who have concentration issues. Yeah, Ritalin, you know, for example, <coughs> gets abused too, right? Because people say, yeah, this works great for this guy over here, man, I'm going to take some of that, you know? Um, people who don't actually, who are not diagnosed with, with some disorder will take it so they can, they can uh, focus more easily. Now, you know, if, if focusing was something that was keeping you from actually paying attention to things, they carve it probably before that. Um, think about antidepressants. Um, you know, they've made some people's lives worse. Sometimes they lead to suicidal ideation, and they depress libidos and things like that. People gain weight. But on the whole, would you say that antidepressants, on the whole, you know, the thing about the whole spectrum of them, have been something positive for, for human beings? Some people can't manage without them. You know, it's hard to, you know, be wiser and more skillful when you're staying at home all the time because you don't want to go out because you're, you're thinking, you know, depressed thoughts constantly. Um, well, that could be something that, that Descartes talking about. All the other things. Think about how hard it is for you guys to concentrate when just a few things in your body are off. You know, like when you're in pain, right? Chronic pain, that makes it hard to concentrate. Um, sometimes it makes you irritable, angry. Um, think about all sorts of other things that that interfere like that. If, if medicine, if knowledge of the human body and how we can change it and affect it helps to take away those, those causes, then it also improves things for our mind, doesn't it? Not just our body, but our, our mind. So Descartes, that's, that's part of his, his project. So I just wanted to give you sort of a, a sketch. Let's, let's go now and look at some of his, his big ideas. Um, so, Descartes starts out, uh, part four, by engaging in doubt. And he's not actually saying, I doubt all of these things all the time. <clears throat> I don't know whether I exist. I don't know whether I have a body. I'm so confused, or things like that. Sometimes people read him, and then they get you know, really worried about these sort of things. Maybe I'm dreaming all the time. Maybe we're stuck in the matrix. You know, <clears throat> That's not really what he's saying. He's saying, this is a possibility. It's not necessarily the way things are, because you know if you were going to say, yeah, we're definitely stuck in the matrix, well, you could doubt that too, right? Doubt is just a state where we don't know. We're not, we're not sure. And Descartes uses it as a part of his method. You notice that he said in the first uh, rule of method, don't accept anything as true unless I really know it to be true, clearly and distinctly, right? <clears throat> so anything else, you should doubt. Um, I mean, you could cover a lot of ground with this. Is today, you know, Thursday or is it Friday? Um, how do you know? I mean, you can be relatively sure because hopefully, you know, you show up and, and your classmates are all showing up and you can be like, well, you know, well, if I screwed it up, they all screwed it up too. They're showing up the wrong day. And so did Dr. Sadler, right? That would be what Descartes would call moral certainty. 
as opposed to metaphysical certainty. Metaphysical certainty is when you, you just can't be uh, wrong about it. You know that it's the case. That's what he's after. And so he says, what can we doubt? So let's start by thinking about the various things we can doubt. Do our senses sometimes deceive us? Yes. You ever like, you know, see somebody in a crowd, and you think it's a friend, and you go up to them and you tap them on the shoulder, and they turn around and they're ticked off at you because, you know, why are you bothering them? They're somebody totally different. Um, okay, well, that's your, your senses. Um, sense perceptions. Put the, water, the stick in the water, is it bent or isn't, is it not bent, you know? Look off in the hazy distance. Um, tower sometimes, you know, that's round looks, or a square tower looks round. You know, you guys are familiar with all these sorts of things, right? Um, go into a fun house, you got all those weird mirrors. Obviously, you don't think that your head suddenly became gigantic and your body tiny, right? You, you know that that's, that's an illusion. So you know your senses can deceive you. So let's doubt the stuff that are, <coughs> let's not um, believe them automatically. Um, what else? He says, some people make mistakes in reasoning. And he uses the example of geometry. And we can think about mathematics and logic. Um, well, that's getting deeper, isn't it? It's one thing to doubt whether your senses are telling you the right information. It's another thing to doubt whether you're actually getting things right when it comes to really basic reasoning. Maybe you could actually be deceived, so 2 plus 2 is actually 3. And every time you carry out the calculation, something goes wrong consistently, and you don't notice it. That's possible, isn't it? It just has to be possible for us to doubt it. It could be the case. Um, he also brings up some other things that we normally think about grasping through our senses. And this is the fact that you have a body. Are you sure you have a body? Are you sure that you're not just some brain in a vat somewhere? That somebody is, you know, flooding with, with signals? I mean, that's probably not the case. I hope it's not the case that we're all, you know, disembodied brains and bodies. That'd be or in vats. That'd be horrible, wouldn't it? What would be the point? But it could be. What's that? What would be the point? Oh, I, he doesn't worry about that. He just worries. Maybe somebody could do that sort of thing. I don't know. Somebody could be a sadist, and, and they want to screw with us. In, in another book, he talks about this evil deceiver. Imagine an evil deceiver who devotes all of his energies to to deceiving you. And he's got like as much power almost as God, not quite as much power, but, but just about, and so he can like, you know, rearrange math <coughs> and stuff like that. Sometimes when I teach this material, I would like show, you know, Dark City or, you know, The Matrix or mm -hmm. things like that, because, you know, these are Cartesian types of uh, doubts, or the 13th floor. Um, you can doubt whether you have a body, you can doubt whether there is an external world. So in just three paragraphs, Descartes took away most of the things you're certain about. Um, that can be a little bit off-putting. Now, what can't you be wrong about? He looks at the fact that he's actually doubting. He says, um, I examined with attention what I was. I saw I could pretend I had no body and that the world and the place where I was did not exist. <laughs> But in spite of this, I could not pretend that I did not exist. You can't doubt your own existence. Why not? Yeah. Doesn't he explain that, like, the reason why you can't doubt your own existence is because, like, you're Who's actually doubting? being able to doubt it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you're, actually, you're actually being able to, like, think through the process of doubting it. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you say, I doubt whether I exist, somebody can say, wait, who's doing that doubting? Uh, and then if you say, well, it's me, there you are, right? So there's at least one thing you can be completely sure of. So long as you're doubting, you exist. And actually, Augustine said this. Um, Descartes isn't coming up with this on his own. Where he's going with it is, is original to him, though. Yeah. Couldn't you say that about any individual thought, then, if you can yes. think you exist? Yes. And that is what he's, that's where he's going to go. 
So we, we do all this doubting, and then we say, if I, if I doubt, I'm thinking, therefore there must be something that's doing this thinking. That's me. I'm, I exist. So he says, um, by contrast, in the very act of thinking about doubting the truth of other things, it very clearly and certainly followed that I exist. When he says clearly and certainly, <clears throat> you guys see this, right? It's a very easy logic to follow through. If you are doubting, you have, there has to be a you to do the doubting. You know, otherwise, maybe the doubting is happening over there. But if it's, you know, if it's somebody else doing the doubting for you, how are you realizing that's the case? There must be a you, right? So he says, if I only stopped thinking, even though all the other things which I'd ever imagined were real, I'd have no reason to believe I existed. Now, this is not <coughs> saying that as soon as I stop thinking, I, I quit existing. That's the way some people portray Descartes, right? Or if you say, I don't think, I, I, then suddenly you pop out of existence. All he's saying is, so long as you actually are thinking, you can say this, I think, therefore, I exist. And this is called the Cartesian cogito, because it comes from the words cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. And this has been, you know, changed to all sorts of other things, like I feel, therefore I am, I will, therefore I am, I Facebook, therefore I am, you know, you can Google me, therefore I exist, all of those sorts of things. But the original is Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am, because what's doing the thinking? And this is a really key point. He's not just getting out of this the mileage that now at least I can be certain about something, because, you know, what do you do after that? Where are you going to go from... I, I think. Well, he draws another important conclusion from this, which is, I am a thinking substance. What it means to be a human being is not to have a body. It's not to have two eyes, a nose, ears, you know, two of most of everything for the most part. Uh, well, 10 sometimes, right? Um, it's to be a thinking thing. What's most you, according to Descartes, is not your brain, your mind. That's you. That's what, what the real kernel of your identity is, is your thoughts, your memories, your doubts, your feelings, your perceptions, your <coughs> reasonings. All of that is you. All of those are modes of your thought. Um, everything you've learned, <coughs> you've made part of you. It's, it exists in your mind. So he says, um, I realized that I was a substance whose essence or nature is only thinking, a substance which has no need of any location, does not depend on any material thing. So this I, that is to say, the soul, he says, that's your soul, um, by which I am what I am is entirely distinct from the body. You can imagine your mind apart from your body, right? So that means that there are actually two separate things. This is what we call Cartesian dualism. We'll talk a little bit about this in just a moment. So he says, um, it's easier to know your mind than the body, right? Think about your knowledge of your body. Can you actually see every part of your body? If you have a, the right set of mirrors, I suppose you could. Well, the outside, right? Um, how's your liver doing? You want to take a look at it? I mean, you're, you're probably all pretty healthy right now, I hope, right? Um, don't drink too much, because I'm here. I mean, it, it takes a toll on your liver after a while. Um, don't get hepatitis either. That's, that's not good for it. And, you know, you, you guys have all seen, like, the pictures of, like, uh, lungs of smokers. Mm -hmm. You know, they probably showed them to you in health class to turn you off from smoking. And, and you know, thankfully, your generation smokes less than my generation. Yeah, we, we smoked all the time as college students. Back, back then, you could actually like, smoke in classrooms after class is done. Yeah, we used to, it was stupid. We used to light up. Like, class would be finished, we'd light up right away. And that changed about halfway through, through college when they passed the law that said you can't do that in public buildings. Um, just goes to show you how, how things, you know, customs change, right? Going back to the point, though, you can't really know your body that well. I mean, you know certain things about your body. You know, like, what it feels like, and you, you know, um, 
you know generally what you look like by looking in the mirror. Um, you can tell when things feel off, right? Some of you are sick right now. How do you know you're sick? Like, how, how do you know you're not feeling well? You, yeah. Okay, so you have a sensation, and, and you know that's that's not good. Something's wrong here. I guess so you take a cough drop or tea and honey or something like that, and then you feel a little better, right? <coughs> but do you really know that much about the workings of your throat? <coughs> right? But your thoughts, you can look at your thoughts anytime you want. That's completely accessible to you. Your memories, they're available to you. Sometimes it takes some work to call them up, right? But you can, you have, you have more transparency, Descartes would say, to yourself as a mind than you do as a body. And your mind, um, you actually have more control over, too. You don't have that much control over your body. So he says, um, after, after this, I considered in general what is necessary for a proposition to be true and certain. So here's going to give you a criterion. Um, for since I had just <coughs> bless you, found one idea which I knew to be true and certain, namely that I think, therefore I exist, uh, I thought I ought to understand what this certitude consisted of. Why are we so sure about this? What makes us so sure that we're actually right when we do this? You might say, well, look, it's obvious. It's evident, right? It's what we call self-evident. If I think, I exist. There's got to be something doing the thinking. Well, what is that certainty? or truth, it has to do with the fact that we're dealing with ideas that we perceive clearly and distinctly. And so the part says, you know what, I learned something else here. Anything that I perceive clearly and distinctly must be true. So, you know, if 2 plus 2 is, is equals 4 is clear and distinct, I'm going to be able to rely on that. You know, if I can clearly see that I, I am, you know, not the same thing as my body, that's clear and distinct knowledge. I can rely on that. Where is he going to go right after this, though? He's not going to talk about the body or the mind right now. Now he's going to talk about one other kind of substance. Where does he go with this? Anyone remember? The conscience? What's that? The conscience. The conscience? That would be part of the mind. Um, he talks about God. Why is he talking about God? Well, um, God is going to get him out of all these doubts. And something that may strike you as a bit of circular reasoning, <coughs> sometimes called the Cartesian structure. <coughs> He's going to come up with an, uh, an argument for God's existence. He actually has two. One of them is, is, a, is an awful argument. You know, basically God is like, you know, God's existence is like, a, 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 you know, self-evident in the way that geometric Proofs are, this is a very debased form of what we call an ontological argument, but the argument that he gives first is kind of interesting. Yeah. Oh, I just thought of something. For all of his arguments for his own existence, wouldn't that also kind of push for like a disapproval of God? Because we doubt certain things, but yet God would have absolute knowledge, so God could not doubt. Oh, yeah, God wouldn't doubt. But... Now, this, is not, this is not really a problem for him. To doubt is to lack perfection. We only doubt because we don't know everything. So, now he, that actually is, is the course that he follows. He says, you know, look, I doubt. Can I think of a being that doesn't doubt? God. Now, he's helped out by the fact that he's, you know, surrounded by people who are always talking about God, right? So, you know, could you have this idea come to you if you're like in a totally, totally atheist landscape? I don't know. Um, that'd be kind of an interesting thing to think about. <clears throat> but in Descartes' case, he's got lots of people around him who are talking about this. And one way in which we understand God is a perfect being, <clears throat> not being able to doubt, not being able to, you know, say, really get angry. You know, all the biblical stuff about getting angry is sort of language for, yeah. My only, like, my only point is, like, through the imperfections and, like, of the thoughts and recollections and this internal, like, debate, yeah. we can actually fundamentally prove that we exist. Mm -hmm. Because if you did not have this debate, then you, there could be no you to exist. So, you, yeah, that works for you. God doesn't need to prove that he exists. God just does exist if, if there is a God. Um, it's not like he would you know, think to himself, I'm not sure whether I exist or not. I better figure this out before I start creating things or anything like that. 
You know, I mean, if you think about it, this is putting limitations on God. And there's all sorts of other interesting problems I come up with. Wait a second, we're talking about a perfect being, right? There shouldn't be any limitations. But I'm, I'm going to put those off uh, for, for, for the moment. Uh, those are real issues. Those are real, real deep metaphysical problems. But let's look at what he says. So he, he says, I've got this idea of a perfect being. Um, now let me think about where my ideas came from. Could some of my ideas have come from myself? Sure. You know, think of a pink elephant. You ever seen a pink elephant in real life? But you're imagining one right now, right? You were taking at things and like pushing them together in your imagination, and now you got a pink elephant. You probably, it probably looks kind of like Donald because you know, you know, or like an elephant you saw in the circus somewhere or in the zoo. And who knows? Maybe your shade of pink is slightly different than his shade of pink. But we don't have to worry about that. The whole point is, some ideas are able to come from us. And Descartes has an idea here. He's relying on a presupposition that the causes of ideas have to be at least as great or real or true as those ideas. So, you know, created things like pink elephants, no, no problem imagining that. Where did I get this idea of perfection from? Did I get that from myself? No, because I'm not perfect. Where have you guys ever seen perfection? I mean, you've heard the word, but how did you know to associate that word with anything? So if it didn't come, if that can't come from us, we're not perfect. We're not going to create an idea of perfection. It had to come from something greater than us. And you're not going to get an idea of something that's perfect coming from something that's not itself perfect. And what do we call that traditionally? God. So therefore, the idea of God exists in us. We're able to make use of the idea of God because God actually exists and has, has provided us with that idea. Um, so he says, uh, you know, if we want to know about God, just think about what it means to be perfect. You know, what are, what are perfections and what are imperfections? So he says, um, uh, since I know about some perfections which I don't have, um, there must be some perfect, other perfect being on whom I depended and from whom I acquired all I, I had. Um, and just think about the, the other perfections that I, I lack. What are some of the other perfections that I lack? Uh, I, don't, I don't have certainty, right? I don't know everything. Perfect being would know everything. What are other ways we're imperfect that you can think of right now? What are, what are ways in which you're imperfect that have bothered you? You say to yourself, boy, I wish I was better off in this, this respect. Yeah. Yeah, we, we screw things up. That could be partly knowledge, but that could be also partly we're not totally good, right? We, sometimes our will is not, not um, entirely the way it ought to be. Presumably this perfect being, perfect will. Yeah. Be it sick. Ah, yeah. Um, we are subject to change. Uh, and that's an imperfection. God is presumably, like he says, immutable. Bless him. Thanks. Like uh, physically, like strong and stuff? Yeah. Now, God doesn't, for Descartes, God doesn't have a body. Um, and. Well, couldn't it be like will too? Like we. Yeah, like all powerful, um, omnipotence. There are a lot of things that we'd like to do that we can't do. And then making mistakes sometimes flows from that too, right? And, you know, omnipotence and omniscience are kind of connected together in weird ways, yeah. We are affected by time. Yes. Now, you know, myself, I don't necessarily consider that an imperfection, and maybe you don't. Um, but Descartes certainly does. He thinks that it's better to be eternal than, than, than not to be eternal. So now we've got the <coughs> idea of God, we've got the nature of God, and where are we? We're somewhere in between God and nothingness. Uh, God is absolute being, perfect being. Nothingness is non-being altogether. We're somewhere in the middle there. 
And when we make mistakes, it's, it's our sort of participation in nothingness that is causing those, those mistakes. And he says, um, after this I wanted to look for other truths, and I proposed to myself the subject matter of geometricians, after wi uh, which I understood as a continuous body, you know, extensively infinite in, in, uh, in length, width, and height, you know, extension, what he calls. When you're doing geometry, what are you, what are you thinking about? Space. Spatial objects. Right? This would include engineering. This would include um, anything that involves the mathematics of figures. And he says, um, can I apply this you know, clear and distinct criteria to everything else? He says, yeah, actually. Um, if, I, if we assume a triangle, it's three angles. What do they add up to? They have to add up to 180 unless you're in non-Euclidean geometry, which Descartes didn't know about. Um, yeah, you can't get away from that, right? Isn't that clear and distinct in your mind? Triangle has to have um, 180 degrees. How many angles can a triangle have? Can it have two? No. No? Can it have four? How about 36? No? I, mean, I don't know what a 36 again would be, but it would be something other than a triangle, right? Um, that's what makes it what it is. You perceive that clearly and distinctly. And now, actually, Descartes says, you know, I can be assured of something. Um, Anything I perceive clearly and distinctly is going to be true, going to be reliable. Why? Well, because God has actually set things up that way. Once you've got God in the picture, you can rely on everything else. And he says, you know, we, we should make a distinction here between people who think that um, everything is a matter of the senses or the imagination and those who understand um, what we're doing when we talk about the, the mind as the person, as being distinct from the body. He says, some people think that you know, God doesn't exist or that the soul doesn't exist. And here, here's the reason. They um, never raise their minds about matter of sense experience. They're, they're so accustomed not to consider anything except by imagining it that anything that's not imaginable seems to them unintelligible. And he says the ideas of God and the ideas of the soul, they're not things you can actually imagine with pictures. Right? You're not, you didn't have a sense of, you know, where's your soul? I can't look into you and be like, I'm looking in your eyes and now I see your soul. I mean, we say stuff like that in Valentine's cards and poems, but that's, that's only metaphorical, right? I can't see your soul. You can't even see your soul because it's not the sort of thing that can be seen. Nor is God. The sort of thing that, that can be seen. So, so long as we remain tied to sense and imagination, we're not going to get this sort of thing. If, however, we conceive of it just you know, purely through reasoning, the mind detached from the body and its senses, then we can actually get this. So he says, um, now, you know, the very principle which I've taken as a rule, only to recognize as true all those things which we can see very clearly and very distinctly, is guaranteed only because of the fact that God is or exists, that he is a perfect being, and everything which is in us comes from him. For it, that it follows that our ideas or notions being real things which come from God, to the extent that they're clear and distinct, in that respect cannot be anything but true. Now, that, there's a problem there. This is what we, uh, in philosophy, call the famous Cartesian circle. So Descartes got from, I think, therefore, I am, right? And then he started thinking about clear and distinct notions are, are true, right? And then once he got that, he started talking about you know, God, and he proved that God exists. And, you know, um, people along with this is, is you know, uh, all good is, is, in other places you put it in this terms, not a deceiver. Right? Um, Right? There we go. Um, that's right, isn't it? I'm 
except after C. Yeah. So here's the problem. I think that therefore I am, I can be completely sure, sure about it. <clears throat> this clear and distinct notions being true, um, let's say I wanted to actually doubt that. <coughs> Well, Descartes says the reason you can be sure about that is, is God exists, and God is not going to you know, allow you to be deceived about these things that are clear and distinct, so you can trust those things. But didn't you use that criteria in order to prove that God existed? That's kind of a problem. That's not necessarily, you know, uh, damning, because if you actually take God out of the picture then and say, well, we can't rely on this anymore. Then, according to Descartes' logic, there goes the clear and distinct ideas, too. And now we can't know anything except for, I exist, maybe everything else could be an illusion. So if you don't want everything, uh, here's Descartes' reasoning. If you don't want everything else to possibly be an illusion, you better believe in God. Um, not necessarily the, the best argument for, for believing in God, but that's, that's the internal logic. So, um, let's say we do actually buy that, that God exists. What does that give us? Well, anything that we perceive clearly and distinctly, we're going to be okay with. Could we build up our knowledge on this basis then? Remember the Cartesian method, right? Start with the simplest things, get clear and distinct knowledge about them, and then build up from that to, to larger bits of knowledge and larger bits of knowledge. Could you conceive of doing this? Isn't that what your textbooks are supposed to be doing for you? Start with basic principles. Make sure you fully understand them. Good textbook actually explains them clearly and distinctly. A bad textbook just kind of hems and haws and you know doesn't really tell you much of anything. And then you build up from that and build up from that. That's the Cartesian project at work. And notice that it really only exists so long as you keep God in the picture. Now, this is not the God, as I say, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not the God who does miracles. It's not the God who people have, you know, uh, personal relationships with or anything like that. It's just a God that's a perfect being and gets everything going and isn't going to screw with you the way that, you know, maybe some other beings of similar power might do. Um, so that is part four. Let's think about part five now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that he talks about in there that I'm going to skim over. Um, you know, if you were doing a modern <laughs> philosophy class and you were talking about the Galileo incident, you might be interested in that sort of thing. The long, the upshot of this is there's some things Descartes didn't publish because when Galileo got condemned, Descartes had a system very similar to Galileo, and he was like, ah, I better, I better keep this under wraps for a little while, you know. But he's talking about some other things in here that are particularly interesting. Now, if we have this notion of the mind and the body being totally different things. This is what they what we often call dualism. The mind and the body are both substances. <clears throat> and they're different kinds of substance. Your body is fundamentally different than your mind. Your mind is fundamentally different from your body. Your mind and your body are not the same kind of thing. They cannot be compared with each other in that way. Um, your brain, if that's the case, where, where does your brain fall? Which side do you think it falls on? Both. Yeah, there's, there, in a tricky way, a certain part of it. Yeah. Well, um, it's a physical sense, it's your body, and body. Yeah. Your sense, it's your mind. Yeah, there's some weird way in which it maps onto your mind. And Descartes seemed to think there was this little gland inside of your, your, your mind. He had a kind of <clears throat> interesting um, picture of this. So he talks about the animal spirits. This is something people believed in. That was part of the medical science of the time. Animal spirits, think of like the humors and you know your, your blood, your spleen, all these sorts of things. Animal spirits were another one of these kind of things. And they'd move things around and somehow they'd like, you know, record impressions and and you know take on directions and things like that. And he thought there was a little tiny, think about almost like a joystick, because that's in some way how he's describing it, or like a controller. It's the pineal gland, which is you know, somewhere in, in your brain, I don't know exactly where. And Descartes seemed to think the animal spirits would like knock it around in different ways, and somehow that was the juncture between the brain, which is completely bodily, extended, 
and your mind. Now, you never really explain this to anybody's satisfaction. And it's, it's very difficult to, to do this, especially if you're going to make it in terms of the pineal gland and the animal spirits. But let's put that aside for a moment. Um, let, let's say that, that that difficulty has been overcome. What he's talking about here that's particularly interesting is human beings, we know, are a mind which is in a body. And he talks about your body as being sort of like a ship and your mind is the pilot. It runs the ship around. It, it makes the ship do what it's going to do. The ship is not really um, the pilot, right? It's a tool. <coughs> so you are like that. You know, you think about those Japanese robots, you know, the, the big, you know, thing years ago with the people would get inside them and, and you know, cartoons, they fight each other with these giant robots. It's sort of like that, right? That's actually a little bit more like it than a ship. Or another way of thinking about it is your, the human being is a mind in a machine. Because your body is what? He says your body is a super machine. Um, he says, uh, none of this will seem strange but what he's talking about to those who know how many varieties of automata or moving machines human industry can make using very few pieces in comparison with the huge number of bones, muscles, nerves, arteries, veins, and all the other parts of the body in each animal. They will look on this body as a machine which having been made by the hand of God is incomparably better ordered and more inherently admirable in its movements than any which human beings could have invented. That's <coughs> Your body is still a more complicated machine than anything we've yet um, been, been able to develop. Your brain already is still, you know, uh, ahead of, of where we are with computing. Although we're catching up pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so he says, I stopped to reveal that if there were machines which had the organs and the external shape of a monkey or some other animal without reason, we'd have no way of recognizing they were not exactly the same nature as animals. Why? Well, because for Descartes, ant animals are just super complicated machines, just like your body. Animals don't have a mind or a soul like you do. So therefore, um, they're essentially, you know, organic machines. Um, now, I know your cat loves you and purrs and gets next to you and stuff like that, but that's just stimulus response, he, he would say. It's learned certain behavior, and it's, it's even sort of metaphorical to say it's learned certain behavior, because what learns behavior? Minds, right? Um, so he says, how could we recognize, he says, we have two very certain ways of recognizing that something like a, a really well-designed android. An android is a robot designed to look like a human being, right? Uh, how could you recognize that an android is not a human being? This is one of those science fiction-y questions, which is really interesting to think about. One second, the wall line has two, has two things. So he says, the first of these is that they would never be able to use words or other signs to make words as we do to declare thoughts to others. So what makes us human, or having a mind, is being able to use words or signs to declare thoughts to others. So he says, we can, we can imagine a machine made in such a way that it expresses words, even expresses words relevant to some physical action. So like you poke the machine and it says, ouch, don't poke me. I don't like that, right? But it's not really conveying a thought. It's just doing what it's programmed for. So like he says, um, you cannot imagine a machine that arranges words in various ways to reply. So the key thing for this is to reply to others to the sense of everything said in its presence, the way the most stupid human beings are capable of doing, Descartes says. The second test is that um, we would discover that they, these machines act not by knowledge, but only the arrangement of their organs. Whereas reason is a universal instrument which can serve in all sorts of encounters, these organs need some particular arrangement for each particular action. So he says, it's impossible there is in a machine's organ sufficient variety to act in all the events of ways. So it can't act rationally 
in um, many different settings. There's limitations. So, what were you, you going to say? Uh, emotions. Yeah, Descartes doesn't worry so much about that. He, has, he actually does have a, a book called The Passions of the Soul where he, he treats the emotions. And um, he tries to look at it in a bodily perspective and in a, a uh, mental perspective. Um, I, would, I would say that's a, that's a really important one. You know, a, a novelist who did a, did a lot of thinking about this was Philip K. Dick. Uh, if any of you have ever seen The Blade Runner, um, Dick is, is the guy who wrote the book that that's based on. Actually, a lot of movies out there. The, Good movie. What's that? Good movie. Yeah, um, that was the first of his, his things to be turned into a movie. Um, Through a Scanner Darkly, um, that was another one. Ah, we can go down the whole list. Like, but six or seven of his, his stories have been turned into the movies. The Adjustment Bureau, that was a, recently, that's a, a Dick story. So, um, Dick actually does talk about emotion. He talks about empathy. He's got this, uh, this, this test in The Blade Runner, or in Android's Dream of Electric Sheep is the story that it's, it's based on. Um, and it's based on, the, the test is based on seeing whether the, the being that you want to tell, is this a human being or is this a robot, can empathize. Human beings are capable of empathy, or at least most human beings are, you know, sociopaths aren't. Or with <coughs> that type of schizoid personalities aren't. Um, robots definitely aren't. But Descartes doesn't go that way. Instead, he appeals to more um, intellectual things. So he would say you can tell whether somebody is a robot or a human being because um, even though they're able to use words, they're not actually able to use them to convey thoughts in a fluid, continuous way where they're responding to others. They're replying to others in a, in a sensible way. And it's interesting because when I was a kid, they already had programs that they were designing to mimic human beings. Like they had one called ELIZA, which, you know, back then it was all in DOS and you had to you know, write with, with lines and stuff like that. And I remember reading through this. And ELIZA was supposed to imitate a um, psychotherapist. So you would you know, type on your end, and the lies would say things like, that's very interesting. Why don't you tell me more about that? Or um, how do you feel about X, where X is the statement that you just made? And it looks like it's responding to you. But at, after a certain point, you realize, maybe after it says the same thing several times, I'm not actually talking with a human being here. There's, there's something just purely mechanical about and the same thing too, by the way, when you're talking with human beings who are like totally checked out, you know, the purely mechanical action. Um, so it's, it's an open question. Could we design a machine sophisticated enough where it would actually reply in a way that mimicked thought well enough that we couldn't tell the difference? I mean, this is a possibility in our time. The other thing is, is it flexible enough that it can adapt to new situations and not treat them all as being the same kind of situation. You guys have all heard that expression to the, to the person whose only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You guys heard that expression? It's a useful one. Um, don't use it for everything, because then you would be using it, you know, that expression like a hammer for every nail. Um, you're able to adapt yourself to many different situations, right? To figure out what tool to use, what concepts to use, how to look at things. Sometimes you make mistakes. You think that situations you're in now are just like situations you were in before, but you can adapt. Can a machine, even a very sophisticated machine, can it adapt? Can it, can it escape its programming? Can it rearrange its programming? We now have programs that can rewrite themselves to a certain extent. Can they rewrite themselves enough so that they would potentially be able to take in any situation make sense out of it. What do you think? Well, let, me, let me ask you the broader question. Do you think this is a sufficient test for telling human beings apart from robots? Or maybe just, you know, human-like things that are grown in test tubes that don't have actual minds or souls? I don't know. But I think even now, like, even Siri is more, like, advanced. She does, I mean, she's, it's still the same, like, response thing, but 
there's, she has so many, she's programmed to have so many different responses that it almost seems like she can reply in different settings. Do you think Siri thinks? No, but it's just it, like they, you could program so many yeah. things into her that it almost seems as though she can. What would it take for, for you to feel like she's actually thinking? One sec. I don't know. Well, you had, before we answer that question. Well, Siri basically just takes what you say, turns it into a word, and then search it up, searches it on Google. And then, like, what you're saying, if it, like, finds me immediately, like, like where's McDonald's? It searches McDonald's. And when yeah. you search McDonald's on Google anywhere, it literally shows you the closest one. But Google so, is like some huge, diffused technology. It's, it's sort of like having robots that have their mass mind right. out there. That's kind of why she seems so real, though, is because, like you said, like she, it searches mm. like on Google, so it has like Google has a lot of different contexts. Yeah, that's why. So it's like a dual person. I was gonna say like exactly what Tom she was saying, because I think a way that like Siri could see more, I guess, like human is yeah. like it looks up Google, but it like searches through Google, and a lot of things on Google are written by humans. That's true. There's a sort of parasitic. Elements. Yeah. Is it truly possible though for humans to act in every situation? I mean, don't we freeze off and just that's over the fact that Siri could ever think unstimulated? Oh, by itself. Yes. Yeah. So, Siri. Like, you just left your phone with Siri on somewhere. Yeah. Like, and eventually, like just she starts going, "Where'd you go?" That would be interesting. And he's like, or "What's what, going on?" What is, what is the purpose of my life? Siri doesn't ask that. Yeah, like, or once I said to Siri, "Is like I'm sad," and she just didn't do it. She was like, "I don't know what to tell you, Alexis." And I was like, "I'm sad." <laughs> some of the things that they that she says so are hilarious. Like, yeah, I've, I've seen that, some. They're of so funny. And there's that great commercial I may have mentioned to you guys, where there's a series caught between a, a warring husband and wife. Have you guys seen that yet? Mm -hmm. Google Google Siri husband wife argument and uh, see what comes up.